Dr. Alexis Cowan, I am so excited to speak with you today. I've been anticipating our discussion for a long time. We've had to reschedule a few times, but here we are. The, the, the recording gods are with us today. So um, we're going to learn some really fascinating topics today. My audience knows a bit about lighting and circadian health, but we're just, it's kind of still new. So I'm glad that you're here. We talk a ton about blood sugar and metabolic health, but now we're starting to learn how to integrate all the lighting piece and the circadian piece and how important that really is for blood sugar regulation. And I think it's been a missing component, a missing piece for so many people. So I'm really happy to have you here today. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to chat. And yeah, I mean, I also come from like a very metabolically centered background where, you know, even though there are these immense interactions between light or light environments or circadian biology and metabolism, that they're just really not being explored. And in fact, there's a lot of like hypocrisy even going on within like academia, let's say within metabolism and and related spaces, because we're out here doing research, like maybe just dipping our toes into how light impacts metabolism. And then at the same time, while we're doing this research, we're blasting ourselves with like fluorescent and LED lights completely disconnected from the fact that we're like we're we're a living experiment and we're doing like the worst things we could possibly do for our biology when we're in a setting like that. Absolutely. And I just think to myself how amazing the human body is to absorb everything that we, we've thrown at it, especially in our generation, like this generation right now, like that we haven't completely broken down and like just extinguished as a species. And um, I know you definitely live, you know, you walk the talk and um most of you are listening on, on the podcast, but if you're watching on YouTube, you can see Alexis is outside and, <laughs> and recording and outside in the, in the, in the natural lighting environment. So that's amazing. But your background story is really fascinating, like how you even got interested in this. And, and I know you have like a weight loss story of your own. So if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about that and how it kind of led you to where you are now, that can give our listeners a little bit of your background. Um, history. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I feel like I was initiated into a health journey from when I was born, essentially. Um, as early as two years old, I remember having a very traumatic dental procedure done. To this day, I still don't know exactly what was up, but it was like multiple hours long. It was like my mouth was mechanically cranked open for extended periods of time. And I was essentially in a, like a uh, post-traumatic stress state from that for into my 20s honestly um, then as early as first grade I was dealing with some chronic recurring strep throat issues I got pulled out of school and homeschooled for all of second grade the part of the first grade and when I went back to school in third grade my weight had like exploded and I was about like double the weight of my classmates <clears throat> and I attribute that to Initially, I attributed that to the antibiotic use that I was on for basically months um, because of that strep. But also on reflecting on my childhood, I do believe I had a significant black mold problem in my childhood home where I lived from, you know, zero through 18 years old. And so basically from third grade up to sophomore year of high school, my weight just kept spiraling and I maxed out somewhere around 270 pounds. I would also get frequent respiratory infections throat infections, skin issues, like um, skin infections and acne and dysmenorrhea. It was just kind of a mess and wanted to do something about it myself. And I, honestly, ironically enough as well, whenever I would go to the doctor, nobody ever mentioned my weight at all, which I feel like is such a disservice. Um, I think I'm a, I just turned 32 in May. Um, I don't know if it was just something about the 90s and early 2000s where it's like this was a new thing. We weren't really identifying it as like this global problem just yet. Um, but anyway, I kind of took the reins into my own hands and started going to the gym and counting calories, essentially like 1500 calories a day. I was going to the gym for like two hours a day, hour of cardio, hour of lifting. And over the course of a year, I lost about 90 pounds. And then over the course of the next few months, I lost maybe an additional 10, 20 pounds. Um, and that was when I was basically going into my senior year of high school. So I had this transformation in my health and really was like the first glimpse I had into my ability to control the way that I feel in my body and also the way that I look and the way that I feel about myself. Um, and so I think that was a really important initiation um, into just the idea of having some level of autonomy over health. 
And shortly after that, though, you can imagine from like the strict calorie counting and also it's just at that time I was very focused on not food quality, mostly quantity and just calories. So I was eating a lot of processed foods and it was more of a low fat, high carb, higher protein diet. And as a result, I developed very severe eating disorder, like around food, feeling guilt around food, fear of regaining weight, um, not really just feeling good about what I was putting in my body. And I also developed IBS in this post weight loss period within the, like a couple years after that. I was having like blood and mucus in my stool every day for like a year, went to the doctor about it. They basically said they couldn't do anything except they have like some immunotherapies they could try if that's what I wanted to explore. And I should say that I've always kind of had a distrust of the, the standard medical model just from my young life experiences where I felt like it failed me. It didn't help me at all. In fact, it set me up to feel worse. And so, again, I was just like, I'm going to figure this out by myself. And I did some research online, figured out that a lot of people with these issues do elimination diets. So that's what I did. And I found out that dairy was a major trigger for me. And when I removed it, all my symptoms went away. Um, and so that was kind of my first foray into understanding more about food quality and like the specifics of what's going in my body and how that's making me feel versus just calories and quantity. So I had dairy eliminated for like six years, strictly not even butter and no, no symptoms of IBS, nothing going on. This kind of blends into my time when I started my PhD at Princeton. Um, during my time there, I was at the Rabinowitz lab, which is one of the top metabolism research labs in the world. Um, I wasn't researching the microbiome when I was there, but I came upon microbiome research while I was studying at Princeton and really fell in love with it and saw how important it, it would be for sculpting health, but also for maybe getting back to eating dairy again, because I don't think people should have to live on these highly restrictive diets for long periods of time. I think food is, in addition to nourishing our bodies, is supposed to be fun and social. And so much of that goes out the window when we're forced to not eat certain foods or food groups. So um, I found Joel Green's work, the, the Immunity Code, and went down the rabbit hole on his microbiome approach, which is essentially focused on bifido and acromantia um, and optimizing these two clades of bacteria in order to optimize the microbiome and the gut as a whole. And so I did his gut protocol shake, which was like a human milk oligosaccharide powder, red fruit powder, and apple peel powder, which we can get into the specifics of why those. But after using those for about six months, I started reintroducing dairy and had no issues. And then since that time, I have not had issues with dairy. And so uh, that really just impressed the importance of shaping the, mic the microbiome and like helping people regain food freedom, be able to digest a whole range of, of nutrients that may have caused them issues in the past, um, and really just allowing a lot of benefits to be incurred, including like anti-inflammation at the whole body level, um, better digestion, less bloating, and um, also weight loss, as it turns out with acromantia, which is highly associated with metabolic health and body fatness. So that was kind of how I found the microbiome and went down that rabbit hole, personally saw the benefits. Circadian and light biology still was not on my radar at this point. I, I had an inkling about circadian biology from like Sachin Panda's work, but it felt, it didn't feel super important to me at the time. I'm not sure why. It just wasn't delivered in a way that was like, this is life changing, like pay attention to this. And so I was going about my life. I graduated Princeton in 2021, December started my private practice where I teach courses and see clients one-on-one -on -one and other practitioners. And that continued, you know, basically with a microbiome-based approach through spring of 2023, around April. And that's when I came across this podcast that Rick Rubin did with Andrew Huberman and Jack Cruz. And it was really an unpacking of the light story in a way that I couldn't even fathom was real and like my jaw was literally on the floor for the entirety of like the six hours of those two parts of that podcast. And after that, I did a very deep dive on all of the research he was referring to and all the concepts that he brought up on that podcast, Jack Cruz did, and just completely changed my own life overnight. Like I just basically moved whatever I was doing inside, outside, revolved my life around the sun, developed a relationship with the sun for the first time in my life. And prior to that, I had had a good relationship with being in the sun. I'm mixed, so I always tanned really easily and barely burned and always enjoyed being in the sun, but not from an intellectual standpoint. And if you were to listen to the mainstream media and medicine, you would say, oh, if you're going outside and getting a tan, that's actually really bad. There's no such thing as a healthy tan. They literally say that in like their literature, the dermatology literature. And um, 
from my experience and research at this point, I can very confidently say that that is absolutely propaganda and not rooted in any sort of biological truth. And so that was last spring, this transformation happened. I basically shifted my entire practice to revolve around light biology and circadian biology first and foremost. And then we, we can do other things with the microbiome. The microbiome is also impacted by UV light exposure on the skin. So it's like the whole story kind of comes full circle for me where it's like, yes, the microbiome is important. And these other as aspects of reality are very important for shaping that microbiome, including your access to nature and your ability to get UV light on your skin. And so that's kind of like my full circle journey to kind of getting where I am today and why the things that interest me are so important to me. Yeah. And it's so important to be open-minded as a practitioner. And sometimes, yeah, you just, you hear things. I was like that with intermittent fasting. Like I would hear it like, mm -mm, there's no way that that can be healthy. Like we cannot skip meals. We have to, <laughs> you know, and, and now I've changed a lot of how I teach um, fasting methods and that just so that we protect our circadian health, but it's, it is, it's like, if you're closed minded and closed off, to all of these natural ancient healing modalities. Um, you know, it's just, that's, those are the, that's the messaging that we received today, unfortunately. But I remember like I started as a dietitian, I was conventionally trained in 2000. And I remember like taking people in the little council room and going through the Fugai pyramid and putting them on the biometric scale and saying, okay, this is about how many calories you're burning. We need to have you in this deficit to lose weight. And you know, 1600 calories a day and less than 30 grams of fat and less than 10 grams of saturated fat, you know, like we would, <laughs> yeah, that's about what like I remember giving people maybe, you know, men were maybe like 40 or 50 grams of fat, but it was crazy. You know, I'm like, oh my gosh, no wonder, you know, it was like 33% of people were overweight or obese at that time. And now it's almost double that. And like, no wonder. And that's just in 20 years, you know, that, that this yes. is loaded and the lighting environment's gotten tear, you know, worse, the EMF, like everything is just compounded. And we look at our environments and we wonder why we're sick, but it's not our bodies, it's our environment. And so I feel like that's such an important message. And, and, um, I love all of the messaging that you're putting out. Um, but we'll come back to the microbiome piece, hopefully later, we'll have time to to tap into that a little bit, but I'd like to dive in a little bit deeper um, on the types of lighting, like just throughout the day and how they, well, we'll come back with to blood sugar after that. Cause you had mentioned like the UV light is really important for blood sugar regulation and microbiome health. And um, like, I know I've started putting like a red light on certain areas when I, we, we can't be outside and um, you know, I'm, there's just so much to pick out of your personal story. <laughs> it sounded like you had probably had ulcerative colitis at one point yeah. when you were having the blood and mucus. My son has struggled with that for years. I'm like, I'm putting the red light on his, you know, on his um, abdomen. So there's just so many things to, to pick out of your, your own personal story. And I love how it really came full circle, but um, yeah, let's talk about a little bit about the different types of, of light that are coming from the sun and how, they're so different. And so and different times of the day are important to get exposure because I think, I think where people get a little stuck, uh, uh, first off, they get a little overwhelmed. Like, you know, I start putting out messaging, oh my gosh, now I got to go and watch the sunrise. And then, oh, I have this UVA. Now I have this UVB and oh my gosh, now I got to get out for sunset and I'm driving the kids and I'm, you know, I'm working and, and it just gets overwhelming. But if we could just like simplify the different types of lighting and put it into practical terms. Like, no, you don't, you don't have to be outside all day. It's like, that's just not the society that we live in anymore, the culture that we live in. I wish we did. It's like, how fun would it be? You know, it's like, I wish we could have a, a mix of, you know, living outside and inside and, you know, the, all the, the, the modern and the, and the, the ancient world come together. But um, yeah, let's start there with the different lights and, you know, how they're playing a role and how they're going to setting you up throughout the day you know, the exposure to all the different types is important. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing I'll just briefly mention quickly, because you talked about closed mindedness in science and in medicine, and that also is directly reflected in the light environment, because if we're basically blue light toxic, if we're under artificial lights and on screens all day, and we're not getting any of that balancing red, infrared and UV light, it actually depletes our dopamine system, burns us out and makes us basically not be able to critically think well and be more dogmatic. And we see that, I think, manifesting at the political level, at every level, essentially, in society today. And 
from a, like a chemical and, and metabolic and transcriptional standpoint, we can see very clearly why that would be related to the behaviors that people have with regards to light. But with regards to um, different lights, uh, light frequencies throughout the day that you will encounter that you can be mindful of when you're trying to figure out, you know, what to optimize. Sunrise time of day and sunset are very enriched in red and infrared light. That's long wavelength light that's able to penetrate deeply into the body where it can directly stimulate um, mitochondrial function. Uh, it also structures water to create exclusion zone water, also called easy or fourth phase water um, or coherent domain water. There's lots of different names for it, but essentially it's this jelly-like form of water that actually facilitates metabolic processes, enzymatic processes in the body and is required essentially for cellular function. Um, so the, the long wavelength red and infrared light is really important for that. In the morning, like seeing the light around sunrise, depending on where you are, the window of time where you're getting access to like fully red and infrared light will differ a bit because UVA starts rising pretty quickly. So for here where I live, about 30 to 40 minutes after sunrise, UVA starts coming in. Um, we'll get into that in a second, but essentially if you want to see sunrise and get access to that red and infrared light, that also helps to turn on the pituitary gland um, that turns on sex hormone production, pregnenolone production, the precursors to a lot of sex hormones. And so for anybody who has hormonal issues, seeing that light in the morning is going to be a huge win. Um, and if you can stay out for that transition into UVA, that's also going to be good because UVA turns on a specific photoreceptor, which is this basically receptor that's present on your skin and eyes other areas as well that when stimulated sends a signal to your body and your brain about something about the light environment. So neuropsin is the name of the UVA detector that's present in your skin and eyes that gets activated when you see that morning UVA light coming into the spectrum. UVB hasn't risen yet so we're really just getting um, our red and infrared light, our visible spectrum, and the UVA coming in. So that's something that our biology predicted it would be exposed to just based on you know evolution essentially uh, we evolved to be outside as creatures and we've gone against that in the modern day and i think a lot of what we're experiencing health-wise is um in relation to that um and just dis disconnection with nature in general and not being under natural light but so that morning light is important for those reasons um, UVB starts coming up a bit later when you see the UV index. Typically, that's going to be related to both UVA and UVB. But if you're looking at like your weather app and looking at the UV index, if you're trying to optimize for your UV light exposure, which I would argue that you should for reasons that we can discuss, um, then you're going to want to get outside when the UV index is highest to get the biggest bang for your buck. And you need the, the least amount of time essentially outside during that time of day because that would be like solar noon between like 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., because you're getting more UV light at one time. So it's like, you know, if you're um, somebody who doesn't have a lot of time on their hands and needs to kind of prioritize doing specific behaviors and like consolidating, then that's going to be the most efficient way to do it. If you're somebody who easily burns, seeing that sunrise earlier in the day is going to really help to turn on those skin mitochondria and help them to make melanin, which is like what happens when you're tanning in response to sun versus burning. So melanin production requires uh, mitochondrial function and mitochondria to be online and ready to go. In addition, uh, not blocking UV light from coming in your eyes is huge as well. So essentially, there's this cascade that happens when UVB light touches your skin outside of the vitamin D story, which is, of course, important as well, um, called proopiomelanocortin or POMC, which is produced in the body in response to UVB light exposure on the skin and the eyes. So when UVB light hits your eyes and your skin, this POMC molecule is it's this pro-hormone that's cleaved into 10 different unique hormonal products um, is synthesized. And three of the products of POMC are alpha, beta, and gamma MSH, or melanocyte-stimulating hormone. As the name implies, these three hormones directly stimulate melanocytes to make melanin, which is what our body makes in response to UVB light if everything is going well. So if you're burning and not making melanin well enough, it could be because you're maybe under artificial light a lot, which that blue light in artificial light sources will impair mitochondrial function on your surfaces, including your skin, eyes, and proximal brain regions. And like we said before, you need those mitochondria functioning in order to tan in response to the sun. Um, you could be blocking the, the light from getting into your eyes, wearing sunglasses, glasses, contacts while you're getting like direct sunlight. That's going to block the production of the alpha, beta, and gamma MSH in your brain 
And the brain production is also very important for stimulating melanocytes in the skin. So we really need the coordinated expression of POMC in both the brain and the skin in order to fully engage that melanin producing system. Uh, interestingly enough, three other of the POMC cleavage products are alpha, beta, and gamma endorphins, which are our endogenous opioid molecules. Uh, so in effect, nature addicted us to being in midday sun by yoking the production of these endorphins to UV light exposure. And yet the literature will suggest to you, not the whole body of literature, I mean, there's a lot of literature saying otherwise, but the mainstream literature in medicine will say, you know, never go in UV light, essentially. It's nothing but toxic. And and yet there's so much contradicting that even in their own literature with the relationship between vitamin D status and a whole host of diseases, including melanoma, including autoimmune diseases, other types of cancers, diabetes. Um, there's just so many conditions that are linked to vitamin D status. And vitamin D status is primarily determined by your UV light exposure, specifically the UVB. We're not really meant to get it much, much through the diet. We're getting some from eating fatty fish and like organ meats and things like that, which is typically associated with more of a wintertime setting. So like if you're um, living in an area where the ground freezes, you're going to be eating a more, you know, fat and protein based diet because that's what's available seasonally in your area. And so you're naturally going to get more dietary vitamin D in during those times just through the foods that are available. So nature doesn't make mistakes in that way. Like everything is set up for you to be successful. The problem is that in our modern day, our frontal lobes have gotten in the way of our ability to just leverage our environment in an evolutionarily consistent way. Instead, we're mucking around with everything, thinking that we can play God in some way and that, you know, we can outsmart nature. And it's just not possible because we are quite literally a part of nature in every way. We can't separate ourselves from that. Um, so that's really kind of the midday sun story. Super important if we're looking to lose weight, if we're looking to um, get control of our appetite. So I didn't mention this before, but the alpha MSH molecule that I mentioned with regards to melanin production is actually highly associated with obesity. So if we get under production of this alpha MSH molecule, what happens is we're not getting the proper signaling cascade to parts of the brain like the hypothalamus, which regulates our energy expenditure and our appetite. So it's well documented that if we can get this alpha MSH production optimized through POMC production, through UV light, then we can actually naturally suppress our appetite and naturally increase our energy expenditure, which is like the holy grail because vast majority of the time, if you're cutting calories, your basal metabolic rate's coming down because your body's defending that, that body weight set point because it thinks that it's going into some sort of starvation mode and it needs to conserve energy versus if the body feels safe and is naturally integrated with its environment, it's going to naturally uh, regulate its body weight in a, in, a, in a healthy way. I don't really think obesity is adaptive whatsoever. It's clearly not because it's associated with so many different diseases. It is it is a disease in itself, I believe, and it's due to our, our poor light environments, I think, largely and the deficiency of UV light and red and infrared light that we have in modern lifestyles. So that's kind of the midday sun story. Sunset story is pretty similar to sunrise story. Again, you're getting that long wavelength light um, that's going to help support your mitochondria. And then after sunset, it gets dark outside and we should try to respect that as much as possible by mirroring the outside and the inside world. If we're, you know, obviously going to be sleeping inside and being inside at night. And yes, you may need some lighting, but the more you can reach for dim red or amber lights, it's going to be way less disruptive to your circadian rhythm, which we can get into the signals that like set circadian rhythm, but darkness at night, like dark darkness at night is absolutely crucial for our bodies to enter that rest and recovery and regeneration phase that so many people aren't because they're glued on their screens and their TVs and their phones and they have all these artificial lights on at night, not realizing that it's literally increasing insulin resistance, decreasing HRV, uh, not supporting the proper neurochemistry recovery that you would get from proper rest. Um, it's not setting you up for having success the next day and subsequent days. And people are doing this virtually day in and day out. And so it's really just burning people out. Thank you for that. That's definitely better than I could have ever <laughs> explained. So yeah, I mean, people just think I gotta, you know, the sun hits my skin and most people know, like I, I manufacture vitamin D from the sun. Like most people know that, but I think it kind of stops there. Um, so yeah, so fascinating. 
I've always been a firm believer. Like I've always loved the sun. I was a lifeguard. I <laughs> even I live in Wisconsin, so I'm like, oh my gosh, anytime I can be out there, I will be. And I've I've always tanned well, also sort of my kids, thankfully. But um, yeah, I was never like I was that mom who'd have the same bottle of sunscreen for like five years because <laughs> like I'm just not like it's in there just so I can you know, say I have some, but, and of course my <laughs> change on that, but how important is it? So you, you said like our eyes get the signaling and our skin get the signaling. Um, so I'm at a pretty Northern latitude. It's really warm right now. And we're, you know, at the long part of the, the year of the longest days, um, you know, the sun isn't going down until almost nine o'clock here. It's up, up at five o'clock here. Um, but how important is it with the eye signaling, the skin signaling, like if it's a winter here, and like, I'm outside watching the sunset. I'm outside taking a walk for a UVA say, um, how important is it to, that, it, does it have to like touch the skin and enter the eyes or, you know, are you getting the same amount of benefit, um, being exposed to these different lightings or say someone's at work and they, you know, they can't go and strip down to their swimsuit <laughs> midday. Um, but I would gather there's, there's benefit even to just letting the light signaling come in the eyes or be on the skin, or is it really best to, to try to get both or, you know, what, what would you say to that? If that question makes sense for you? Yeah. So, I mean, ideally we're getting both at the same time, there are areas of our body that we can expose to, um, like, optimize our response without having to, you know, be practically nude. So if you expose your abdomen and your calves to the sun, you're going to get a, a pretty big boost in that palm C production because there's essentially nerves under the skin on those areas in particular that um, are really good at producing palm C. So if you're exposing your eyes, even if you wear contacts, like, just carry your contact or ca case around with you. That's what I do. Um, so if I'm getting any impromptu sun, I can just pop them out. Um, I, when I was doing my postdoc at Penn last year, what I would do is like during my lunch break, I would go out. I typically wear like crop tops almost all the time anyways. But like, even if I didn't, I would just like roll my shirt up a little bit, find somewhere to sit where I can like take my shoes off and put my feet on the ground and just take my lunch like that, like with my glasses off. And, um, even if you're only doing that for a few minutes, it's going to be way better than not getting anything at all. Um, so that's what I would say with regards to like practicalities of, you know, if you can't, you know, be in your backyard during the middle of the day and <clears throat> exposing all of your skin, um, that would be a good compromise. Um, but even if you're just, you know, not even able to expose your stomach, just getting your calves is going to be way better than nothing. Obviously, get your face and your eyes and whatever skin is available, still going to be way better than nothing at all. Um, with regards to the red and infrared light, depending on, you know, what somebody's up to at sunrise and sunset, you can get the benefits of that even if you're wearing clothing because the long wavelength light can penetrate through clothes. Um, so even if you're like driving somewhere at those times, like just roll your windows down so some natural light can come through. We didn't talk about this, but <clears throat> just by nature of being behind windows and glass, you're going to be creating uh, an enrichment in blue light and you're changing the light spectrum into something that's more alien to our system. So uh, glass, standard glass filters out about 40% of near infrared light, also known as infrared A light. And it filters out almost all of UVB. I would say all of UVB and like mostly UVA as well. Um, so it's, and essentially what, what in effect you're doing is concentrating the blue light part of the spectrum because you're removing infrared A and you're removing the UV. And so again, it's almost similar to like sitting under artificial light just by the virtue of being behind glass. So the more you can just like open windows, open doors to get some real natural light in through like screens, that's going to be also beneficial. Um, if you have like a, you know, a desk that's near a window that you can pop open, that's going to be way better than doing nothing at all. If you don't, um, re-engineering some red and infrared light back into your indoor environment will be also beneficial. So I have like a little portable red and infrared light panel from Mito, um, from Mito Red that I use. I also have like their big panel that I use a lot, especially during the winter time. And um, so that is a couple different wavelengths of red and a couple different wavelengths of near infrared that you can at least add back into your working environment if you're not able to open up any windows. You can also get special light bulbs are called full spectrum light bulbs um, that essentially more closely mimic sunlight. So they put the red and infrared back into the light. Um, Chroma makes the sky portal, which is pretty cool. We have one of those. Um, and that has a knob that you can change the color temperature throughout the day. So like when it gets closer to midday, like after sunrise, the light is like very 
bright white and you need that bright light in order to fully turn on your central nervous system and cognition and like get your juices flowing. Um, and we kind of want that to be diminished throughout the day. And then as it gets closer to sunset, we want it to be more red and that device essentially has a knob so you can add a little bit more red to it as the day goes on. Um, so that is pretty cool. Um, if you're doing like an indoor environment that also like clips to the side of your desk and it like goes up and like shines down on you, which is also cool because, um, uh, angle, the angle of incidence of light interacting with your body is also important for stimulating different aspects of your brain and physiology so when light is up above you coming down that's more associated with midday like higher alertness uh better cognition versus light as it approaches the horizon that's more so associated with like you know the sun setting or rising potentially um but it's not really gonna turn on your nervous system in that same way so for that reason it can be also beneficial if you're going to have lights on at night to have them on like a desk level or even on the floor so that it's not coming at you from above and activating those neural circuits that will be more stimulating to your central nervous system that's a lot a lot of great tips i know i changed out our bulbs like in our living room and our bedrooms at least you know that that far and we don't really have many overhead lights in our house, but the few times, like my husband, like I haven't had overhead lights on in months. I kill this, like I'm washing my face for the night or something. And I, and I always do it before it gets really dark so I can still see, but I don't turn the lights on and he just flips them on. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, turn, turn those on. I don't want those on anymore, but I switched them out to red and it makes a huge difference. And then I put my blue light blocking glasses on. Also, but, um, I just, you know, my kids aren't as crazy as I am about wearing glasses and that, but it makes a difference for them too. And there's just these little things, but I didn't know, I didn't think about the angling of the, the light. So that is helpful. And then I knew about the abdominal area being a really good receptor area for sunlight, but I didn't know about the calves. So that's kind of nice that you can just roll your, your pants up if, if you have some sun and, and expose your calves. So yeah, I love all yep. these practical things that you can just give people because I do, I hear them like, Shanna, well, I, I wish I lived your life where I could just go work outside or like sit by your pool, but I don't like, I'm, you know, I, I'm a teacher. I teach, you know, I'm inside all day or I work as a nurse or whatever. And yeah, we can get into that whole thing. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like there's the reason that I think that this information hasn't become more mainstream is because it's quite disruptive and inconvenient for a lot of the structures that we have in place societally. Yes. But I think it's that's one of the most important reasons why we need to address this, because like the fact that we're making kids sit inside in school during like the best hours of the day for them to be outside playing. And then like we basically put them on drugs if they're not able to sit still during those hours, which is just absolutely mind blowing the number of kids that are on psychiatric meds today for ADHD when they naturally should be energetic and running around and having fun and playing and not like developing their intellects at such a young age. Like we literally have like four and five year olds sitting in a desk studying like how insane is that that like what are we preparing them for like doing a desk job like a nine to five that they can't stand and like just basically living for the weekend like it's an absolutely insane concept that I think just needs to die societally that we're kind of clinging on to but I think a lot of people have woken up to it since COVID because a lot of work moved remotely and people realize I can do this job remotely I don't need to go in and sit somewhere just to like like uh, for appearances so it looks like you're busy like no actually people can be even more productive when they're at home depending on their setup and their preferences of course but um, I mean I personally noticed uh, the big shift in like people moving to working more remotely and having more flexibility in their schedules and being able to do things a bit more on their own terms. And I think it's going to be dang near impossible for corporations to get back to pre COVID times. I think people are just too like awakened to an alternate possibility that it's just going to continue going in this direction. I think. Yeah, I agree. And I, it is tragic for kids. I mean, I have three kids, two of mine are in college and one's in high school. So I've seen them, you know, it's like, I know what's taught in the kid in the classroom. I was a substitute teacher for several years. And basically from middle school on, they have a Chromebook in front of them most of the day. And in, at least in our schools, there is a lot of windows, but many schools don't even have windows or there are shades on them. And they're eating crappy food all day and the recess time or the outside time is just diminished and diminished because, you know, state mandates how many minutes they have to have of this curriculum and that curriculum. And then, yeah, when yeah. you look at what they're learning, it's like, 
no, that it's not going to matter in your later in life. So I know I feel like so my, oh gosh, there's just so much that needs to change healthcare school. Um, but, uh, uh, like you said, I feel like the awareness is getting out there and it's just a matter of, you know, people like you and I and moms and, and, you know, people raising kids who want them to be healthy and not put them on ADD med medications and them, all they need is a little education and, oh, wow, if I, if I can buy my kids some daylight blue blocking glasses to wear at school, and then I can, you know, put some on at night, make sure they're getting outside, request that, you know, maybe they eat outside, can eat outside for lunch or whatever. Like a few things can really make a huge change, but um, yeah, unfortunately needs to go a little bit more mainstream to make some headway. Um, but so what's, what's happening when people are putting sunglasses on? and slathering up. Like we're told to put sunscreen on before we even go outside. Like I, that is just such insanity to me. And the more fair skin you are, the, the more afraid that you, you know, become. And it's just like, oh my gosh, if I get the slightest bit of color, I'm going to get skin cancer. And like you said, like skin cancer, any kind of cancer, it's highly associated with vitamin D deficiency. So it's like, how are we drawing the lines here? It makes no sense. Um, but what's happening when people are putting sunglasses and sunscreen on, I think that's a really important topic to talk about because we're not saying go out and get a burn and, you know, fry yourself to look like a lobster. Like that's not what we're saying. We're saying like, do have skin exposure and light exposure safely, but, um, you know, is the sunscreen completely negate all of the benefits? Yeah. So this is really important because um, I think there's just this notion that we can, again, outsmart nature and that if we use sunscreen, like, you know, it's just it's fine. But let's just think about what sunscreen is doing. So depending on, you know, whether it's a chemical or mineral sunscreen, generally speaking, it's going to be absorbing UV light, UVA, UVB, some blue light, light, blue light wavelengths as well. Um, and then essentially what that's doing is it's creating a light spectrum that our bodies don't really know what that is. Like, it's not actually something that evolutionarily we would have encountered. And so what I always tell people to do is like, yeah, again, we don't need to go outside and burn. But you, when you feel like you're getting too much sun, what do animals do? They go into the shade. Um, so just go into the shade. Put on some light clothing if there's no shade available. Clothing will block the short wavelength light, the UVA, UVB. So that's another way you can protect yourself. Also making sure that you're getting that red and infrared before, whether it's sunrise or using light panels before and after. Your sun exposure is going to help to protect you from burning. Really cool research showing that um, that I've posted about on my page before. And <clears throat> there's other things we can do too. Like we mentioned the sunglasses, contacts, glasses. If you're wearing those, you're going to be more prone to burning. I wager that, you know, in the next few years, we're going to see that a lot of the skin cancers happened because we were blocking that UV light interaction with our eyes and we weren't able, our skin wasn't able to mobilize the proper melanin response to the UV light. And instead, you know, we're getting more burning and more inflammation in the upper layers of the skin for that reason. Um, so that's huge. Also omega status. So like omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is completely thrown off in modern humans. So we're eating about like a 20 to 1 ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 ancestrally that looked more like a one-to-one -to, -one to four to one tops ratio and the omega-6s and omega-3s are really important because they both use the same enzymatic machinery to elongate to form the more active forms like in the case of omega-3s we have the epa and the dha from um, alpha linoleic acid the ala which is the plant form that most people are getting because a lot of people aren't eating any sort of seafood lamb is another source of dha but a lot of people aren't eating animal-based sources of omega-3s, which is really problematic because our bodies don't produce those EPA and DHA molecules very efficiently from ALA whatsoever. So we can convert about like 5 to 10% of ALA to EPA and only about 0.5 to 4% of that reaches DHA. That's further exacerbated if our diets are enriched in the omega-6 fats because the omega-6 fats, if we're eating a lot of them from like seed oils and processed foods, are going to outcompete that enzymatic machinery for conversion into the longer form. So if we're eating low omega-3, or maybe we're only getting ALA in our diet, and we're also eating a lot of these seed oils that are enriched in omega-6 fats, like our soy, corn, um, you know, canola, et cetera, then we're going to be depleting our cells of the omega-3s they need to actually protect against excess inflammation 
in the skin, but also immunologically as well. Um, not only that, but the omega-6 fats get converted into arachidonic acid, which is also an inflammatory precursor. So just over can set you up for a more low-grade chronic inflammatory state as well. Um, and getting that ratio right is really important, not only for those reasons, but also because DHA is really, really interesting and powerful molecule. That's the longest chain of the omega-3s. That's actually required for your body to harness the photonic energy of the sun, the photons of the sun, and convert them into electrons or electrical energy within the body. So if we don't have enough DHA in our eyes, specifically the eyes are very concentrated in DHA and the brain, then we're kind of going to be at uh, a deficit. We're going to be operating from a deficit. And we're going to be also more likely to burn and not be able to get that proper POMC response in response to the UV light because we don't have the structural components in place to actually serve as a conduit for that energy. Interesting. Yeah. And that, that brings us into another question and topic I was going to ask you about anyway, but you've already covered it was the omega-6 and the omega-3 and the seed oils. And you see, you know, more and more posts or communicating or messaging about how seed oils are tying back to sunburn. And I, you know, I, I had hesitated about posting about any of this. I didn't really know the mechanism behind it and I'd seen it, but I'm like, okay, but it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> and now, it, you know, it makes more sense now and, and why, you know, that ratio being so off and eating so many seed oils can really, you know, come back to skin issues too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, an another part of the mechanism that I didn't even touch on there that uh, might make a lot of sense as well is that because our skin turns over so fast, the dietary fats that are coming into our mouths are going to be highly influential on the fatty acid composition of the membranes of the skin cells. And so saturated fats, if you took like a chemistry or biology course, you might remember like the difference in structure between saturated and unsaturated fats, but the saturated fats don't have any double bonds. They basically are a straight chain and they stack really nicely on top of each other. So they have, for that reason, that's why like butter is solid at room temperature because it has a very high melting temperature because those molecules are attracted to one another and they stay together. Compare that to the polyunsaturated fats, like you look at canola oil, it's very liquid at room temp because it's already reached its melting temperature. And even if you put it in the fridge, it's going to still remain liquid because those molecules, because of the double bonds, they don't stack on each other nicely. And so they basically kind of repel against each other. And that maintains like a this very low melting point where it's like liquid at room temp or even in the fridge. And so you can kind of reflect that now to like skin cell membrane composition. If we have like enhanced membrane fluidity due to the increased composition of these omega-6 fats, essentially what's happening is we're not getting protection against, you know, intense light onto our skin that the saturated fats would offer. And I think it's kind of funny that like the demonization of saturated fats is just wrong in so many ways. I think it makes a lot of sense in the context of somebody who's living an indoor lifestyle, like an indoor sedentary lifestyle. Like, yeah, maybe you don't want to like overeat calories in general, but saturated fats, and we can talk about this more, but saturated fats are the best fuel source that your mitochondria can use to make metabolic water and support cellular hydration status. And so between that and also building these like strong membranes that are robust against the out, 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 um, external environment and like intense sun exposure, it's just building a case for the importance of saturated fats in the diet. And not it's not something that we need to be worried about per se. I, I really think that the lack of sunlight is the primary driver of uh, cardiovascular disease if I'm being completely honest, because UVA light stimulates nitric oxide production, which increases vasodilation, facilitates nutrient and oxygen delivery to tissues. Um, so, so important for cardiovascular health. That rigidity that happens in the uh, vascular system in response to like atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease is due to a direct impairment in nitric oxide production. So we're not getting that reaching of the blood vessels to where they need to go. And it's basically developing like hypoxia in your tissues as well. And then we're also, of course, not engaging the POMC part of the cascade from UVB light either, which is so, so important for regulating your appetite and your cravings and your dopamine status. So I mentioned the endorphins earlier. They're, they're not only important for mood, but also for reducing anxiety, improving cognition and improving dopamine status so that you can actually critically think and make good decisions in your life, which is just huge. And this also relates back to the whole like being myopic and being dogmatic in your thinking. If your dopamine system is not being engaged properly and you're constantly looking for quick hits of dopamine from junk food and junk media 
and whatever else, you're on this dopamine roller coaster versus if you're outside and getting UVB light on your skin, you're cruising at like altitude and you're not going to feel compelled to reach for these things to get quick hits because you're going to already be operating from a place of fullness. Yeah. And it just all goes back to what we were talking about before with nature, not making mistakes. Like if you yeah. eat meat from an animal that hasn't been processed in any way, shape or form, that fat is completely different than something that's been highly processed and bleached and dyed and completely causes inflammation when you eat it. Um, my dad just got out of the hospital, like literally yesterday, he was there for 11 days and put on a cardiac diet. Because, oh my God. Oh, you would, you would go nuts. Um, but again, we were talking a little bit before we started recording, like he hadn't been outside in 11 days. I was asking if he could go and get some sunshine. Oh no, we can't take patients outside. Oh but my God. <laughs> oh no. Oh, that would be way too, you know, he's on the third floor and oh, we can't move him and blah, blah, blah. Um, but anyway, he's on a cardiac diet. And of course in the hospital, they're, uh, they're following the Academy of nutrition and dietetics and all they're looking at is sodium and saturated fat basically. So one day I walked in and he had ordered for lunch, a brownie and sherbet. And that was fine because it was low sodium, low fat. I'm like, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. And then another day when I was there, the dietitian came in and I said, oh, I'm a dietitian. Good luck. Like I've been trying for 30 years, but I kind of just wanted to see what she was going to like educate him about. And of course he's like, I don't need that. I'm pretty set in my ways, but you can just leave it here. And I pick up the pamphlet and of course it's all the don't eat more than this sodium, 2000 milligrams of sodium. And no more than 200 milligrams of cholesterol, which drives me crazy because there's God. not even a, a recommendation for cholesterol anymore. No, but that research is from like the 90s. We debunked the fact that cholesterol oh impact. Yeah, blood I'm like, yeah. there's not even a guideline for cholesterol anymore. And then oh. I got to the fats page. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's like, you know, the yes, eat this. No, don't eat this. And it was the eat corn oil, eat soybean oil, eat sunflower oil eat, um, they said no coconut, no saturated, like don't eat saturated fat, eat lean meats like venison and chicken, which, you know, whatever yeah. there's merit to that. But, oh my God, I was just, I said, to dad, I said to my dad, I put it in the car. I'm like, do not even read, not that he was going to like yeah. going to do what he's doing at 76 years old. But I'm like, and then right down at the bottom, it's eat right. You know, like the slogan for the Academy endorsed by oh. the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. I'm like, this is seriously insane. Like my dad just ordered a brownie and sherbet for lunch and it was okay because it didn't like go above the sodium. And so he's getting sicker while he's in the hospital. And yeah, <laughs> like, well, that's the norm too. It's so yeah. dystopian. It's so dystopian. Like the worst place you could possibly be to be on a healing journey is in the hospital where yes. you're being drowned in EMFs and blue light 24 yes. seven. You're, you're being, your sleep is disrupted every couple hours to take yes. this lab and that metric and whatever you're surrounded by like stressed out people. You're not getting any natural light from the windows. The windows don't even open. Right. There's no they grounding. Don't. There's no to open nothing. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I'm going to at least open your window. If you can't go outside. Like and bolted shut. Nurses, every time the nurses leave I turn his lights off like the fluorescent lights that were above him I'm like we don't need these on <laughs> no oh my god yeah 11 days not going outside at all and he's in the hospital on a wow. I, I was like oh my gosh this is just and I haven't been in the conventional system in years and I thought maybe we were making some headway but no it's it's worse it's far worse yeah. um okay well I'd love to talk a little bit about cortisol before we close out because I think a lot of people women in particular um have very dysregulated cortisol pattern. I did myself. And because I was, I, you know, I was doing a lot of the things that help to regulate cortisol, but I was doing a lot of things that don't. It's like, and I have a lot of women who are, you know, fasting all morning um, and a lot who are just doing it all. They have kids, they have jobs. And you know, I, up until very recently, I, you know, people ask me, well, I have cortisol dysregulation, or I think I have cortisol issues. 
And I'd be like, oh, we got to work on your stress and we got to work on good nutrition because, you know, improper nutrition can, you know, cause more stress in the body. And, you know, we got to get these adaptogens. And I was just missing the whole lighting component. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so huge. Um, but let's talk huge. a little bit about how that cortisol dysregulation is happening. And then what was happening with me and how I found out I had such bad, like my, my cortisol pattern had flatlined by the time I tested it. But I was seeing creeping blood sugar in the morning, despite fasting, despite low carb approach, despite, and I wasn't like over exercising. I was doing a lot of walking, but sometimes I was going to the gym at 5 30 AM under the fluorescent light, you know, uh, things that so many women my age, you know, like they feel like they're doing everything right. And now they're getting cortisol dysregulation they're getting creeping blood sugars, even though they're not eating anything in the morning. So can you explain a little bit about what's happening there and, and how to go about starting to get that cortisol pattern back into balance? Yeah. So the cortisol story is really interesting. Um, cortisol is actually one of two primary uh, circadian biosensors, which is what I like to call them. We have cortisol on one hand, which is kind of associated with light in the morning specifically. And we have melatonin on the other hand, which is considered like the hormone of darkness. Um, there is some nuance to be had there though, because melatonin synthesis is actually, it requires bright light during the day from the sun. Like there's no light that's going to be bright as bright as the sun. That's going to help stimulate that. But the transition from that bright light during the day to very dark darkness at night is what allows that melatonin to be released and allows you to reduce your sleep latency, increase your sleep quality and get better recovery during sleep. And then so throughout the night, melatonin starts dwindling and cortisol starts rising. And when cortisol starts rising more rapidly, that's what kind of wakes you up. And we're kind of really meant to get, you know, sunlight in our eyes as, as soon as possible after we wake up to help regulate and optimize that cortisol response. Interestingly, though, um, cortisol is also a product. Well, the precursor hormone to cortisol production is a product of Palm C. Um, so ACTH is the hormone that basically is produced in the brain and stimulates the production of cortisol and adrenals. And, but, so depending on where the POMC is being produced, that ACTH can stimulate cortisol or that ACTH can get cleaved and its cleavage product is actually the alpha MSH that we talked about before, which re is related to suppression of appetite, increased energy expenditure, um, also positive um, associations with immune modulation and anti-inflammation as well. So I think that's personally a really interesting connection because it almost seems like if you have a dysregulation in that cleavage process that you're going to build up cortisol and you're not going to make enough alpha MSH, which means you're going to be more prone to obesity, inflammation, overeating, um, and not being able to tan, getting more of a sunburn. So I think, I mean, personally, I am working on putting together a framework for building a, a, a light research lab. And one of the questions that I want to ask, like, is, it's at the forefront of my list is to understand this relationship between what exactly is regulating the cleavage of ACTH into alpha MSH and what are we doing in our lifestyles to kind of block that conversion from happening. We already do know that blue light can actually increase the production of the specific uh, ACTH and, and another peptide called CLIP cleavage products of, um, of POMC. And so that will both increase blood sugar and also increase insulin as well, independently of whatever food is coming into your mouth. Um, so that's like blue light's ability to do that. UV light allows us to unlock all of the cleavage products, which I think is a major tell of about like our deficiency in UV light as a society, because if you're indoors, you're not getting any UV light at all. And we evolved to receive both UVA and UVB. Um, at certain levels, depending on the season, of course, there are different programs that, that get run. And actually, even perhaps more interestingly, that our bodies know that this, um, well, red and infrared and UV light are absolutely essential to the point where when we get cold and we get cold exposure, which basically mimics like wintertime, we actually, our own mitochondria make infrared light and they make UV light biophotons, um, which is just really striking data and research that I came across in the past few months, that's just such an important tell about how crucial the, these forms of light are for our biology and the regulation of our, of our biology, that our bodies will literally make them themselves in the absence of, an, of the input from the outside. So it's either coming from the outside in or the inside out. And if your mitochondria are functioning properly, 
it's coming from both because you kind of need both in order to be fully optimized um, in that way. And so, I mean, another major focus of of, of mine is um, just focusing on mitochondrial biology and health in general, as I truly believe it's the root of all chronic diseases that we have. And depending on the hand of mitochondria you're dealt from mom at birth, like those, you know, if you're dealt a, a poor hand of mitochondria, let's say to your liver or to your brain, you may have one tissue that's more vulnerable than the others that if stuff starts to go off the rails that you might, you know, develop a disease in that area because that's the weakest point in your system due to the hand of mitochondria that was dealt there during your development in utero. Um, so I think that's also something I, I like to think about quite a bit, understanding like why certain diseases manifest in certain people or can we predict that? Um, we, can we look at something like mitochondrial heteroplasmy rates, which are like mutation rates in the mitochondrial DNA to predict like, okay, this tissue might be a vulnerability versus others and individuals. But even having said that, the, the really the, the route towards healing and preventing that illness or reversing that illness is going to be treating the body as a whole anyway. And I think that's really one of the major shortcomings of the standard medical approach is the siloing of the specialties and everybody is just myopically focused on their one specialty and there's nobody there to put all the pieces back together and look at your body as a whole because no one organ system is functioning in isolation. The whole system is working together in symphony and if we don't treat the body in that way, we're going to run into issues and we're going to cause collateral damage to other systems of our body if we're trying to just myopically focus on fixing this one thing at the expense of the whole. Sure. So with that blood sugar creep in the morning, we're kind of, we're just, we're working on our lighting environment all throughout the day, correct? So that we can then have healthy melatonin production later in the day. And then eating earlier in the day is important and eating higher protein, higher fat, just as a secondary signal for the body, correct? Just to- Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, I really like Jack Cruz's take on the food question, which he basically says that food is a barcode of the light environment in which your in which the food was grown. So like, for example, if you live in equatorial regions, like near the equator, you're going to have access to a lot of carbohydrate rich foods, plants and, you know, and animals, but a lot of plant based foods as well throughout the year. So because you have a very high quality sunlight all year round, your body can actually process those carbohydrates more effectively. The red and infrared light penetrates directly, stimulates mitochondria to take up glucose and sugars from the bloodstream. There was a recent paper out, I think, in February of this year showing that 15 minutes of, of um, red, I think it was it was red light. It was deep red light, like 670 nanometer light um, on like the upper back prevented the blood sugar from spiking by like 30 percent. So it was like a reduction of 30 percent in, in total blood sugar if you look at the curve. Um, and that was just from 15 minutes of like a specific wavelength of red light on the upper back. Now imagine what you can achieve by taking your meals outside where you're like getting blasted with the full spectrum sunlight that has so many benefits on all the unique wavelengths while you're eating that meal. It's going to support your mitochondria to clear those nutrients effectively. It's going to maintain a healthy metabolic rate and metabolic processing of those nutrients. Um, and so the light story is so, so important for blood sugar regulation from a circadian standpoint, eating your foods earlier in the day, like sh uh, shunting your calories earlier in the day and then having your smallest meal of the day be dinner is going to be the best because you're most insulin sensitive earlier in the day. You're also going to be moving your body throughout the day. So you're not going to get any stagnation of those inputs you're putting into your system because like you eat a huge meal and then you go right to bed. Well, now it's kind of just sitting there and you're not going to recover as well. And your body's going to be focused on digesting that food versus dealing with other things that might be going on we're really meant to be getting into light ketosis every night when we're sleeping, like during the REM phase, getting into a good fat burning state. But if you're eating like a bunch of carbohydrates right before bed and large meal right before bed, then that's never going to happen. And so metabolically, you're already starting off on the wrong foot by, you know, channeling most of your calories and maybe carbs to like your last meal, like dinner meal of the day, which a lot of people do do. Um, outside of that, with regards to like the light barcode story, it also makes total sense from like a circadian and light standpoint that we want to eat a more seasonal diet because that's going to tell our bodies something about the light environment that we live in. So the more we can get our foods locally, locally sourced, like trying to vet from like farmer's markets and find good sources of local foods, it's going to be not only beneficial for your body and give your body the information it needs to understand what kind of environment it's inhabiting, but it's also great for, for the environment and, and, 
just overall supporting your local economy too, which I think is so important. And so many people are getting their food from like, that's flown halfway across the world to reach them. And, and we're out here talking about like greenhouse gases and global warming, but we're not dealing with like the major issue of like, if we were just more so focused on growing our food locally and supporting that we're going to not only get the biological benefits, but also externalize benefits to the planet as a whole, because we're not engaging in this insane global supply chain. That's just, totally unsustainable in my mind. So that means you're not eating bananas and avocados if you live in New England during the wintertime because they don't grow there. And you're also not benefiting your health by eating those types of foods during that time of year either. So just starting to think more about like, okay, what's in season in my area? Do a little bit of digging and see, um, or just go to a farmer's market and then you can just get what you know is being grown locally. I think that's probably the easiest way to go about it. It doesn't have to be difficult. It's honestly pretty straightforward. And I also think it takes a lot of the guesswork and like the um, confusion around eating out of the picture because it's like you're just going to be eating what would be available to you naturally in your local environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's what I've been, you know, teaching more and more, just like keep things really simple. I bought a share for our family every week that's delivered to our door and we eat out of there as much as possible. But yeah, you can just see like everything has gotten so difficult, <laughs> like so many layers. And what about this diet? What about this food? Can I have this? What about my total carbohydrates? And it's like, we've just made things so complicated. And, and I do believe that this simplifies, it can get difficult believe me. I have three teenagers. I'm, I mean, I got turnips in my box last week. They're probably like, <laughs> what the heck are these? And what are we going to do with them? I, I want love turnips. Oh my God. <laughs> Yes. But you know, it's like the, and then of course they, you know, a lot of their friends already think I'm the crazy mom and now I'm feeding my kids turnips instead of ho ho, whatever kids are. I don't even, I don't even know all the food I, or when I do order from a grocery store, I order. <laughs> so I don't even want to go down the aisles and be tempted by anything. But yeah, I think it, I think you're so right. Like it does simplify things. And I know, you know, we're, I'm in Wisconsin and we only have farmer's markets for about six months out of the year that I utilize, but like the share that I get that, that continues all year. And no, you're not going to get a lot of fruit or any fruit with that, that because it can't be grown under UV light during the winter months, but at least, you know, what is going to be broken down and assimilated in your body the in the best way. And I feel like um, and again, it can seem really overwhelming when people are probably listening, like, oh my gosh, now I got to only eat from Shin local. Like, no, like just no, like be open-minded to that fact and, and think about it and, you know, maybe try it out. And just, I think sometimes the simplicity of something like that, like, I'm just going to eat out of my box and I'm going to eat the, the meat that we, I have a lot of hunters in my family, um, but it just, it simplifies things because, okay, this is what I got this week and this is what I, I need to use up. So um, yeah, it, it sometimes is nice to just not have so many options. <laughs> so, um, well, great. I want to be mindful of your time. I could definitely ask you probably about a hundred more questions, but we might just have to have you back for a part two and so very knowledgeable. Um, I believe you have some courses that people could delve into. Tell us about those, where to find you if people want to learn more. Yeah, so I'm currently doing a live program with a good friend of mine named Cheryl Utah, and it's called Vibrant Life Method. It's a 90-day live program. We're doing weekly calls. We're having guest speakers. Um, we're, we're giving them access to one of my courses, Scientific Literacy Intensive, which teaches about scientific literacy and how to navigate the complex information landscape that we live in and scientific literature. Um, there's also a bunch of protocols related to gut health and parasites and fungal infections included with the program. And we're really covering everything uh, related to what we talked about here. We also did a, a, um, a three week program that we unpacked all of the circadian and light biology and that that comes with this program. So that's an awesome offering for people who are looking to really do a deep dive on like the science behind this stuff, but also like the actionable practices as well. Um, so there's that that's currently live. Then there's also my metabolic mastery mentorship course, which is like my flagship course. That's nine modules and there's multiple Q and A's and goes really deep into the science behind like a whole bunch of different aspects of health, including GI health, thyroid health, metabolic health in general, unpacking like basic concepts in biochemistry and understanding like how different organs are contributing to the whole, um, the circadian biology and light biology piece is also explored in that course. 
Um, and I also do work with practitioners in a one-on-one -on -one capacity and like some um, individuals as well, like highly motivated individuals, but I'm more so leaning towards taking more practitioners and working more as like a meta um, consultant so that I can help get this information out to more people at once and just like help the web to spread so that we can make some headway here. And I think it is gaining traction, which is extremely cool. And I'm really excited because like a lot of the tech that we have <clears throat> is really harming us. But the solution to that, it doesn't mean we never have to use tech. It means like we need to make better tech and we can make better tech if we're asking good questions, which it helps then if you're getting in the right light environment, because it actually helps you to think critically and ask good questions. But so like Daylight Computer, for example, they're making this circadian and, and light environment conscious tablet. They also want to make phones and computers that are uh, basically not blasting you with blue light. Instead, they're using ambient light to reflect off the screen to be able to give you an experience of being online that's not going to externalize harm to your eyes, your skin, your entire system. So I think that's just one example of the level of... Um, like sophistication we can get to when we're thinking about making conscious tech that's supporting our health instead of detracting from it. And so I'm really hopeful that that trend is going to continue in all different areas of, of technology, including, you know, the non-native EMFs and all that, which we're just like being willfully ignorant about at this point. I think um, the research quality is just really poor when it comes to these studies on like the 5G and 5G and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and all of them that we need to do better research. We need to be honest about it. We have to be not afraid to actually find out the truth and the answers behind these things because when we do, we can do something about it. It doesn't mean like we we aren't allowed to, you know, use the internet or use these things anymore. We just need to do it in a way that is smarter. And so I'm very hopeful that we will get to that point. I think there is a large corpus of people that are speaking up about these topics and it's only a matter of time before I think we we get to a point where we start making some meaningful shifts in a more positive direction for our health. And in the meantime, we can just be conscious tech users who are aware of the trade-offs of using these things, but we're going to do it in the safest way possible. Um, so that's what I would say about that. I'm really excited for the future. We can definitely do another episode where we dive into some more topics like the EMFs. I think it's a really important one. Um, but hopefully people thought this is interesting and actionable and that they have some action items they can take away and improve their lives with. Yeah. And we didn't even talk about water, the microbiome. Or oh my God. <laughs> there's so much. Oh, there, there is, there's so much, but you're definitely a light in the lighting world. So that is awesome. And I'm actually um, interviewing one of the owners of the daylight computers okay. coming up here in a, a couple of weeks. So we'll get his take on, on what's going on with all of that and um, the developments and in and, and, and the computer that he's creating that has no blue light. So that yeah. is amazing. So you're so right. There's ways around it. We don't have to give, we don't have to go live in a cave and sleep on the ground every night. I mean, that might be nice for a couple of people, at least for, you know, some of us for at least a while, but there's ways to get around you know, how toxic our environment has become in a lot of ways. So I'm so happy you came on today and, and shared everything. You have a lot of knowledge in that brain. <laughs> so I'm glad that you're spreading it. And um, Alexis creates really great content on Instagram. You can follow her. It's just, a, is it Alexis J? Oh yeah. It's just at Dr. Alexis Jasmine. My middle name is Jasmine. So that's what that's right. It is. Um, people can find me there. It's J-A-Z-M-Y-N. I'm sure you can link to it or whatever. And yep, I try to post every weekday something interesting and actionable for people related to light, circadian, biology, and other things too, yeah. water, <laughs> gut, and all the things. So people can find me there. And I'm pretty good about answering DMs and stuff too, if anybody has questions. Great. Yes. And I'm sure your page will just explode because people need this information. They're craving it. It was something I was missing as a practitioner and the more practitioners we can get trained to on the front lines, that's really going to change things as well. So thanks for all the work you're doing and for coming on today. We really enjoyed your knowledge and your talk and everybody go follow Alexis. All her um, information will be linked in the show notes. Thanks for having me.